Hello and welcome to the 2021 Patsy Lee Core Award Reading. Uh, this is our 43rd annual award ceremony. And I'll just give you a little background on the Patsy Lee Core Award. Patsy Lee Core was a student at Normandale in the 1970s, and um, she was very active in creative writing and visual art. She had pieces in the Eidolon, which was our literary magazine at the time. And unfortunately, Patsy Lee uh, passed away very suddenly of cancer um, when she was a very young woman. And her husband began this award for, to honor her memory. And uh, it's one of the oldest at community colleges um, in uh, the state of Minnesota. So we're very proud of the Patsy Lee Corps Award and um, and what it brings to um, Normandale and to our students. So any Normandale student can enter the Patsy Lee Core Award competition. And uh, we're very excited this year to present our winners to you. Um, our judges this year were um, Mike Alberti in fiction and William Reichard in poetry. And um, what we're gonna do tonight is I'll have I'll introduce each of our judges. I'll read their bios for you. And then um, they will take turns introducing the winners um, in poetry and fiction. We'll start with third place and work our way up to first place. So I'll begin by introducing our poetry judge, William Reichard. He's a writer, editor, and educator. His most recent books are Our Delicate Barricades Downed, which just came out, and The Night Horse New and Selected Poems. Reichardt is an adjunct instructor in the English department at Inver Hills Community College. And I have a link where you can buy a copy of Bill's most recent book in the discussion on our Facebook page. Um, Mike Alberti grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He received his MFA in fiction from the University of Minnesota. His fiction has appeared in Colorado Review, Crazy Horse, The Florida Review, Gulf Coast, Indiana Review, Mid-American Review, One Story, and elsewhere. Mike has been awarded fellowships and residencies from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Carmago Foundation, the James Merrill House, the Gentle Foundation, the Jerome Foundation, the Ucross Foundation, the Vermont Studio Center, the VCCA, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and the McDowell Colony. His first book, Some People Let You Down, won the 2020 Catherine Ann Porter Prize in short fiction. And there's also a link for you to buy that book if you're interested as well on our um, Facebook page for the event. Uh, Mike lives in Minneapolis where he works as the managing director for Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. So virtual applause for our judges. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I think I'll have Mike begin by um, introducing um, the um, third place winner in fiction. So take it away, Mike. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, and let me say thank you to Tom and everybody at Normandale for putting this event together. Um, and thank you to all the writers and the winners. Um, it's exciting to be here with you tonight. And it was a real honor to read and judge um, your work. So I'm going to introduce first the third place winner um, uh, in fiction, whose name is Mia Thompson. Mia Thompson's wonderful story, Vitruvia, is at its core a story of ideas in the estimable tradition of writers like Kurt Vonnegut, Octavia Butler, Thomas Pynchon, and Rivka Galchin. Stemming from the image of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, the story asks whether the perfection the portrait represents is possible or even desirable. What I admire most about this story is the way Mia skillfully dramatizes that question taking it out of the realm of the philosophical and grounding it in the realm of immediate human experience, a feat difficult for even the most experienced and acclaimed writers of fiction. Okay, so Mia is having her wisdom teeth out and can't join us tonight. So she actually prepared a recording of herself reading of her, a portion of this story. So I'll play that for you now. Let's see, sorry, <laughs> need to cue it up. Okay. 
name is Mia. The title of my work is Vitruvia, and I will be reading the first three or so pages of an excerpt and then coming back to summarize the rest. Sherbel has a newsprint portrait of Da Vinci's Vitruvian man on the east facing wall in her city apartment. The edge is tattered, with ink. Hi, my name is Mia. The title of my work is Vitruvia, and I will be reading the first three or so pages as an excerpt and then coming back to summarize the rest. Sherville has a newsprint portrait of Da Vinci's Vitruvian man on the east facing wall in her city apartment. The edge is tattered, the ink faded by years of morning sunlight scraping away at its surface. She isn't sure what draws her to it. Perhaps it is the idea of attainable perfection in art, or the sense of complete flawlessness in both proportion and of soul. But she sits in the chair across from the tack on which it hangs, looking over its shapes and edges as if they have anything interesting to say. It speaks of a life she wishes she could obtain, a life wherein no mistakes can be made and no malicious external intents can rip through the thin protective fabric surrounding one's innocence, a life she will never have. Not once does she assume she may see perfection in any circumstance other than inexpensive wall art in an inexpensive home. She has come to terms with this as she has come to terms with her own adulthood, getting used to the bleakness of the planet beneath her feet just as she has learned that nothing can ever truly be better than it is bad. Such extremes simply cannot exist and are impossible in terms of probability, and she has noticed even the smallest reminders of this truth in her own face. Nearing her thirties now, she has started to recognize frown lines fading in, years of stress slowly etching themselves over her to whisper words of passing time. She accepts them because there is nothing else she can do. But perfection does happen to present itself to Sherville. It does, with such severity and even more startlement, hit her right across the jaw like the rounded edge of a cast iron pan on the 19th night of June, when she happens across an old acquaintance while walking home through town. The shadows cast from the dim lamplight around her are ravaging and senseless, as most things are, but the shadow of an old friend are even more so, and she casts to it a look of disbelief as it approaches. Sherville asks the voice, and the shadow grows nearer, a familiar face hitting the small ray of the nearest street light and only confirming her suspicions of who it belongs to. Fee? Sherville replies in complete surprise. I thought you had moved to Chicago. I had, V confirms. I've lived there ten years now. Sherval buttons her coat tighter around herself. The wind grows colder as the moon sets its position above them both. What brings you back here, then, she asks, and another shadow seems to materialize on V's expression that the street lamps haven't put there. She turns somber, her eyes wide in a wariness that Sherval cannot comprehend. I needed to talk to you, she replies simply though a deeper importance enshrouds itself behind the edited phrase. Sherville has many questions now, all bombarding her at once, and she settles on addressing the most linear option. Why? V forces a weak smile, tipping her head to the side. You're in psychology, correct? Sherville blinks. I'm into psychology, interested in it. I have no experience or connection to the practice. Sudden confusion plots itself in her throat. Well then, V sighs with a quick nod. That should be good enough. She makes this decision to herself with an ounce of false positivity before explaining her reasoning. Darkness attaches to her, and the moon itself moves to stop touching her skin. Something terrifying is happening to me, Sherval. Something I do not understand. Sherval feels anxiety pricking at the tips of her fingers. What do you mean? It cannot be real. I must be imagining it. There must be some switch in my head that has been agitated to make me hallucinate its presence, V says, her voice lower, her pupils aflame with a dark fire. But I woke up last week with a sudden knowledge of achievement, and ever since, I have not been able to make a mistake. Making sense of this phrase when taken so off guard by it is a difficult task to process. Sherville does not know what to do with it, her anxiety morphing efficiently into concern. What? I had to find you, V whispers. I need your help. I don't know who else I could talk to who wouldn't put me on some sort of terrible medication the moment I stepped into their office. So here I am, and here you are, and I'm asking you to help me. 
Every ligament seems to solidify in Sherville's stance. She fixes her old friend with a look of skepticism, pausing and taking a subtle step back. You... She hesitates again. How did you find me? The answer comes so quickly that she cannot doubt it. V sounds entirely genuine when she replies, regardless of how implausible the words may appear. I felt like you would be here, she says in fear. I tried to find you, and I succeeded. I told you, I cannot possibly make a mistake. It is driving me insane, Sherville. Please. She becomes a wounded animal, her expression pleading and helpless. And Sherville herself cannot leave such a torn being on the pavement of Fifth Street, even when she is unsure of whether or not it might be safe to touch. I will prove it to you, Fee says desperately. It is a lot to take in, I know, but I assure you that I am not pulling you into some trap. Let me get you a drink. That is my excerpt. I wrote it to correspond with the messages sent out by the world and by media talking about how we should live this perfect utopian life when, in reality, when we detach ourselves from our mistakes and from our weaknesses, we also, ta uh, we also separate ourselves from everything that it means to be a person or a human. So when this happens to V and she finds out that she can't actually make a mistake, she goes through this whole process where she realizes that everything she has known about life, her entire definition of what it means, is completely gone. She goes through a kind of existential crisis, and because of this, throughout the story, she becomes more and more insane, or she's starting to be driven mad by this thing that's happening to her. So she tries to test the limits. This includes stealing food, and this includes running in front of a bus to see if she'll be hit. Eventually, she does sort of have this hypothesis that if she wants to change things or break things in any way, she has to put it entirely in her own hands. So she runs off sort of hinting that she might try to end her life. So after seeing how perfection can ruin someone, Sherville becomes extremely torn and she has this realization where um, she understands that it isn't right to wish for something to be perfect or wish for everything to be absolutely flawless. And she ends up <laughs> ripping the Vitruvian man off her wall and having a big mental breakdown, only to find out when she comes back, she's given some medication. She finds out that V herself never really existed, and this entire time she was having a mental episode using her own storytelling to cope with the relentless idea that she will never have a perfect life. Um, but because she's finally processed it in a way that matters to her, she finds comfort in this. And she finally embraces the flaws as an integral part of her own life. That is my work, and thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Mia, and I hope you feel better soon. <laughs> um, so um, Bill, uh, William Reichardt, our poetry judge, will introduce our third place in poetry winner. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the poet does a great job of capturing what, what I think is you know, sort of the duality of human nature and uses simple uh, images of metaphors to explore singular moments in life. Um, and for some examples, um, I guess if I were a bird takes a look at a shrike, which is actually a bird I've always been fascinated with, so I was happy to read this poem. But another, the rambler I grew up in uses the, the changes in the family home to look at the family itself, how they rep one represents the other. Um, what I remember about my time with my dad uh, looks at the dad as a taxidermist, and really the poet uses that as a way to look at um, herself as a preserver, 
of memory or of image um, in the same way that a taxidermist might try and preserve an animal. Uh, really lovely work here. Uh, so I will say, take it away. Thank you so much. I have um, I have some intros to some poems, but you did a wonderful job of introing it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this first poem is called, I guess if I were a bird, and it came to me at the beginning of quarantine last year. I spent a lot of time outdoors um, as I found it challenging to be cooped up with all that I was feeling. And I started thinking about shrikes specifically and wondering about their temperament, their seemingly dark nature, which at the time felt similar to a battle within me. And so I'm just kind of questioning that and ruminating on that um, and hoping for, for better days ahead. I guess if I were a bird, I'd too be both song and shrike. Who made us all feeling? Who let us possess the ability to both impale and cradle? A rounded creature, frail in all its years, that learned how to kill by happenstance. Its evil tendency born from too little of feet. I wonder if its hunger, like my own, devours the empty, resounds in ways that learn to tie knots, to make shapes of barbed wire that plate the sudden death of any living thing. I've never minded the quilts amphibians wear around their backs, our little scavengers' feet. The blood that I came from sharpened a beak, bore me to hurt, its winding motion. A masked bird snapping a bird much like itself. Somewhere I've never seen, there's a mausoleum without walls and a shrike to whom it belongs. If a violent bird knows how to sing, could we teach it how to love? I would also like to read the next couple of poems that I'm going to read. They come from a chapbook I've been working on titled Significant Streets. Um, I've lived in the same small rural town all of my life and many of the poems in this chapbook explore those specific places and the memories they left me with. Um, in some way, it almost feels like grieving adolescence and saying goodbye to this place that I've ran from and ran back to all my life. Um, this next poem is maybe an ode to the house that I've lived in all my life. The Rambler I grew up in. My parents gutted this house, my mother fresh out of one love and into another, her three kids crying as she pulled up to our new home. A Rambler from a horror film with its wooden paneled walls and orange stains in the tub, cat holes cut into the panel, these little feline doors leading from one room to another like a cat would need to get into a closet. But we were on the lake and four houses down from grandma, three from our uncle and closer to dad. Across the lake, you can see where he grew up, where the cows used to be and that no one went far. Nearly two decades later and not much has changed besides branches cut back and the new fence. The sun still rises from behind that little palm and farm, entering through the sliding glass door, catching the curtains. The same outdated kitchen vinyl from the remodel, the same cold basement tile that freezes the millipedes, turns them into crunching ringlets. We're only two dogs short and mom jokes there's thicker sheet rock from the many layers of paint. The newest in my room, a warm pottery urn. But as a little girl, I had matched the walls to the flowers on my comforter. As a little girl, I painted those walls yellow and blue. This next poem is what I remember about my time with dad. As a taxidermist, he spent much of his time in his work shed. I'd sit on a stool and watch his back work, pick at the black plastic tarp wrapped around the table, pick at the staples, an array of exacto blades and dirty cups full of murky water soaking paint off the brush framed his workstation. Newspaper soaked up test sprays of acrylic paint and fish guts. Below his window was a clipping of my brother, oxidized and holding a crappie the size of his head. Next to that, a picture of him and me. We were at Sula Pond, my little fingers clutching a rainbow. His showroom walls full of hides and eyes, antlers, birds, and fish under ice all memorialized. Creatures captured and unblinking in private moments of their lives, complete with a taxidermy tag. 
I don't recall the station he was always playing or much of any conversation, just the sound the shed door made as it opened, the hum of a fan, and the Copenhagen circle worn into the back of his pants. I think of him often. Think of all the things a kid can't ask, like, do I remind you of mom? And I'm sorry if I do, or how come I don't spend more time here with you? Nervous by nature and nurture, I sat silent on that stool, sat there for as long as I could. And the last poem is about my nephew. It's called The Time It Takes to Love, and it's for Hudson at two. There's something about his dead weight, about holding him somewhere between asleep and not there yet. His two feet dangling while I find my balance, carefully placing one foot in front of the other, avoiding the unshoveled snow. I hardly make it through the door without him waking, removing his boots and shushing the dog. It'd take my arms some convincing, but I'd carry this boy forever, regardless of how my limbs felt. Like they'd been above my head for days, that numbness. That blood going down feels better than the moment of regain. When the odd life beneath my skin prickles like a pin art board asking around, unable to translate the sudden absence of him. And though I lay beside him now and share stories into his sleeping palm, admire his belly rising, there will never be enough time. There will never be enough time to lie with him, still in his jacket amidst the clean unfolded laundry. And I know this when I hold him, I'm most certain when I set him down. While I count the breaths that reach me, I wonder how his face will change because right now it looks just like his father's. And I want so badly to keep him this way. Unknowing, my dead weight next to his dead weight unknowing having just carried him in from the car. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelby. That was amazing. Okay, so now it's time for our second place winner. So go ahead, Mike, let's hear about the second place winner in fiction. Okay, um, the second place winner is, um, Jess Costrello. Um, Jess Costrello's story showcases a multiple of skills and talents. The story's protagonist is an eight-year-old girl named Vanessa, and Jess beautifully manages the difficult task of inhabiting her point of view in the third person, showing us the world from a child's perspective with pitch-perfect prose. I think this mastery of perspective may be an extension of Jess's obvious mastery of characterization. She brings her characters vividly to life in just a few words, such as when she describes Vanessa's teacher, Mrs. Dale, as smelling of peppermint and grapefruit from the essential oils she rubbed on her hands daily. While Jess's story thoughtfully and carefully navigates dark and difficult themes, her belief in family and the power of love backlights this story, making it radiant. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Good. Okay, um, so the following excerpt has content dealing with um, the sexual abuse of a child. So if you believe this content will be too disturbing for you, please mute the reading at this time. Um, I wrote this story to illustrate the power of your voice, um, that you are not alone. It's okay to cry and I promise it ends well. Paper Flowers is the story of an eight-year-old girl with an impossible secret. When she receives a sexual abuse pamphlet in class from the school counselor, she decides it's time to let her secret out. After arriving home, she is verbally assaulted by her stepfather, who reminds her that no one would believe her. So she tosses the pamphlet behind her dresser. The following excerpt is about what happens next. Fridays were usually fun days, except for the cleaning part. Mother always did a deep clean of the bedroom on Fridays. That meant the standard procedure, pick up the toys, organize the closet, sweep the floor. 
but it also involved big ticket items like washing all the sheets and scrubbing the crayon art off the walls and moving the furniture to clear out the garbage Vanessa threw back there. Usually, Vanessa couldn't wait to be done, but this week was different. Vanessa welcomed the long Friday cleaning with her mother and Alana, moving slowly to draw out the process. The piña colada breeze tickled Vanessa's nose as it rolled in through the open bedroom window. The sun hung low in the sky. Its beams shot through the drapes, casting sapphire blue streaks that framed Vanessa's wall art. As she scrubbed this week's Crayola masterpiece of purple clouds and dappled rainbows off the walls, she thought of ways to stay home this weekend. Things like a faked illness or maybe a project that needed to be done for school. But then she remembered how mother always caught her when she lied. So instead, she prayed the cleaning would extend into Saturday or that God would decide it was time to clean heaven and start mopping so it would rain. Anything, so she didn't have to go to La Finca. Elana was under the bunk bed, clearing out the toys that had marched their way beneath the bunk bed um, over the week, casualties of the war that was playtime. Vanessa? Mother's voice broke through the Cuban oldie station playing in the background. Si, sí, mama? Vanessa turned to see her mother staring at a familiar wrinkled packet. What is this? Mother held out her hand. Ilana crawled out from beneath the bunks. She saw what mother was holding and recognized it immediately. She had one too. Ilana made her way over to Vanessa. I don't know, Vanessa replied. She lied. She knew exactly what it was. That little tell-all booklet with the details of everything stepfather had done to her and everything he made her do. Every colored page was another sounding alarm. Vanessa had taken care to color within the lines and specifically highlight the private parts he targeted. She should have known that things don't just disappear if you no longer see them. The black crevice behind the dresser wasn't a portal to another dimension, though today she wished it would have been. Her insides lit on fire. Despite her attempts to keep calm by holding in her breath, the panicked sickness came quickly and was determined to linger. Mother turned through the pages slowly. With each flip, the howling of Vanessa's head grew louder. Her heart skipped beats, flickering like embers choked by dust. She knew what came next. Girls, Mother's voice was stern, though frantic. Tears welled up in her eyes. Is this true, Alana? Vanessa and Alana both hung their heads but remained silent. Mother looked at them through a veil of concern and fell to her knees before them, pleading. Girls, please talk to me. Vanessa thought about stepfather. She thought about everything he said would happen if she spoke up. Her body rattled like blinds caught in the wind of an open window. Alana, Vanessa, please, if this is true, if this is happening, you need to tell me. Mother pleaded. Vanessa clenched her fists and took a deep breath. The kind of breath one can only take on the precipice of change. It's true, Mama. Vanessa finally found her voice. Mother looked up at her in horror. I promise it's not a lie. Vanessa could feel tears welling up behind her eyes. Don't cry. Big girls don't cry. Despite her best efforts, tears rolled down her cheeks as if the pain of the secret had finally condensed. Vanessa questioned why this had to be so hard. She wondered why God allowed things like this to happen or why he loved the sound of hearts breaking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. I just want to read the rest of it now. <laughs> it's like a cliffhanger. Um, okay, so now we're on to second place in poetry. Uh, take it away. Bill, I'm sorry, you need to unmute. There we go. I got it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I know how to do this. Um, so uh, Lisa's poems uh, make a really wonderful use of space. Um, they create a very spare sort of image driven work. Uh, there's a lot of breathing room in the poems. And as a reader, I appreciate that because it gives me a time to pause in between lines um, to just take a breath and, and, and see in my mind's eye, what I'm reading. Uh, I think wonderful portraits um, 
the rower about the uh, the person in the, in the boat rowing just that sense of the way that it captures the liquid motion of that um father came to say good night with the smell of winter is really beautiful it's very deceptively simple i think but but so much deeper than it appears uh, so lisa roman Thank you. Um, okay, so the first one is falling and it came from um, a dream. And I just wanted to capture that sort of um, feeling of something unfolding while we're watching it happen. Falling. Gently, I leaned back, hesitating, waiting. Your body surprising and soft accepting my weight against you, tempting me. I let myself go. The curves of your body and mine conformed perfectly, abandoning myself. The flush of white heat emanated from your skin and enveloped me. And um, the next one is um, taken from an assignment on American sentences, which is um, they're single sentences with 17 syllables. And then I expanded on that. Spring. In the end, I came out on the other side, like the mole, issues from the ground in springtime. And I had completely forgotten where I had been all this time as the dark behind me swallowed itself like a phagocyte, absorbing an invading pathogen. The rower. Heaving oars, slicing the water in silence. In your wake, a V-shape lengthens in the afternoon pale. Muscles strain, back leaning, tense, against the water's force, water's force against your boat. Legs push away the next stroke, body and boat gliding a moment in the interim. Oars sink with strength, the wake of the lines, an arrow carrying your weight like a bird taking flight over water. And um, the last one was, um, it was an assignment to write uh, about a childhood memory with a parent um, and um, sensory, uh, one of the five senses, sensory detail from one of the five senses. My father came to say goodnight with the smell of winter. My father's beard smelled like winter when he came home late and came in to say goodnight while my brother and I lay in our bunk beds. The future was far off. It seems like I could reach out now, touch my father's beard, frost and snowflakes clinging to it, his dark scarf with thin yellow lines crisscrossing in plaids. My father's younger self, tall and thin, his beard under the damp wool of his scarf, smelled of winter. I can smell it still, though he is 75. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Wonderful job reading. I, it, you were right, I could hear the rhythms in that the, with the rowing, that was just really neat. Thank you. And now we're on to first place. So if I had a drum, I would do a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Um, while I was reading Emily Christian's winning story, Burnt Pizza Crest and Old Computers, my wife called upstairs to ask, hey, what's so funny? Emily is a wonderful humorist, and in a decrepit old pizza parlor, she's found the perfect setting. Moretti's was an assembly line pizza place perfect for creating the worst pizza combinations Elena had ever seen. As funny as the story is, Emily is able to do a very difficult and rare thing. 
use humor to illuminate a very serious theme. In the end, Burnt Pizza Crest and Old Computers is a story about work. Emily beautifully conveys a feeling familiar to many of us of being disposable, invisible, stuck in a dead end job on an assembly line to nowhere. Emily Christian may be the heir apparent to George Saunders, perhaps America's most lauded short story writer who once said, what I really think good writing does, it reawakens the reader to the fact and value of her own existence. I certainly felt that way after reading Emily's story, which is why I selected it for this year's Patsy Lee Core Award. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this was my first, like my story assignment from my creator intro into creative writing class. And it's basically a synthesis of all the stories of others I've met um, while working in food service. And I titled it Burnt Pizza Crust and Old Computers. And I'm just gonna start from the beginning and leave on a cliffhanger, I'm sorry. Um, so the car slid into the parking spot outside the restaurant. The AC was pumping the stale air of old cigarettes into the cramped car confines. She got out of the car and slammed the door behind her as she pulled on her hat. The sweat from over the years had stained the ridges in off gray color. Pins decorated the cap, proudly displaying her years of service on the front lines. She stared up at the neon sign, proudly presenting the name Morietti's Pizzeria. Elena knew there was a war she'd be fighting tonight. It was never that busy at Morietti's, but it was always understaffed. Stepping into the restaurant, Elena saw Jamie's familiar face who was up front helping a customer with their order. Morietti's was an assembly pizza line place perfect for creating the worst possible pizza combinations Elena had ever seen. The man at the counter was no exception. He had concocted a repulsive looking pizza, a combo of anchovies, pineapple, pepperoni, and ham chunks. Jamie asked him, will that be everything? As Elena walked into the kitchen, Yup, looks good, replied the man. The customer service niceties became muffled as Elena walked into the back room, grabbing a random name tag from the wall and pinning it onto her gray shirt without even bothering to look up at the name. She turned her attention to her most dreaded foe that sat in the corner of the room, the computer. It was a fat box. The skiers seemed to grind every time he clicked a button. It was original with the store. Maybe at one point 40 years ago, it was a revolutionary new way to keep track of hours and store sales, but now it was beyond obsolete. Every time Elena came in, she half expected it to break, but for some reason, it just kept working. The blue circle spiraled around and around for what felt like ages while Elena waited for it to load. She sat back in the office chair that must have been as old, if not older, than the computer herself. Staring up at the wall covered in Sharpie marks from over the years, these ancient hieroglyphics of, I'll miss y'all, Jennifer, Eric was here, and Penelope is the eternal pizza queen. All these people that Elena had never met, despite working here for what felt like forever, five long years. She absentmindedly fingered through a photo album sitting next to the computer, smiling faces of employees who had worked he here throughout the years. Familiar faces of people whose fun summer job quickly became the rest of their lives. People who gave up on their dreams and settled. And the lucky, unfamiliar faces of those who escaped. Elena! A shout from Jamie jolted Elena from the meditative state. I need you to pull a pizza out! One second, Elena yelled back quickly, trying to click her name to punch in. The screen froze. Come on, Elena slapped the side of the computer. Just do your job. An error screen popped up and the spinning rainbow circle of doom appeared. Really? You choose now not to work? The screen went black as Elena desperately pressed buttons. Elena, I'm coming, I'm coming, Elena said, throwing on an apron and leaving the back room, making sure to glance at the clock so she can punch in later. A line had started at the front of the store and Elena wondered how long she'd been back there. Grabbing a giant wooden paddle, Elena opened the oven and the sickly, sickly heat radiated up towards her. She plunged into the stove, retrieving a pizza of anchovies, pineapple, pepperoni, and ham chunks from the depths. It only looked slightly burnt, but it was good enough for whoever would order anchovies and pineapple on a pizza. She passed out the pizza and turned her attention to the line that was now going out the door. It's going to be a busy night, isn't it? It's always busy on Fridays. Here, throw these in, Jamie said, handing Elena a couple pizzas, then turning back to the growing line. I can help whoever's next. Jamie and Elena fell into sort of a rhythm. Jamie would make the horrible Frankensteins of a pizza, and Elena would throw them into the oven and make sure they didn't burn. Although every time, it seemed like the pizzas were well done, no matter what Elena did. Jamie, is it just me, or does the oven seem like it's cooking a little bit faster than usual? Jamie just shrugged and went back to finishing up an old woman's pizza of green olives and mushrooms, passing it over to Elena. Honestly, I don't mess around with all that oven stuff. That old thing scares me. Besides, I'm just the pizza assembler, not the cook. 
After countless more almost burnt pizzas, the line had died down, the sun had set, and the only customer was a scraggly looking bearded man with missing teeth that reeked of weed. He had ordered almost every topping that could fit on the tiny pizza, a mountain of flavors that did not belong together. Throwing the pizza into the oven, Elena turned to Jamie. I never did punch in. That old computer needs to be replaced. It might be broken. I'll go check it out, Jamie said, walking towards the back room. Elena stood alone in the kitchen for a second. Glancing over at the man waiting on the food, on food, she turned and walked into the back room. Jamie was sitting on the floor, trying to pry open the computer tower. What are you doing? I'm trying to fix it. Grab me that cardboard box up there on the shelf. The box was surprisingly heavy as Elena got it down. But what are you actually doing? One of the parts in this thing is broken. I'm going to see if we have a spare part. But do you actually know what you're doing? Elena said, opening the box and looking around at the disheveled metal mess inside. Yeah, I used to fool around with computers all the time. I actually went to school for computer engineering. I didn't know that. Well, it's not like I ended up finishing the degree. I work here. This old bastard's the closest thing I have to a job with computers. A loud bang made both the employees jump. Hey, uh, guys, the nervous voice of a man yelled out. I uh, think my pizza's done. Elena ran out of the back room to see billows of black smoke filling the room. Licks of fire were dancing from the corners of the shut oven door. Jamie darted out from behind Elena. Elena, do something. What the hell am I supposed to do? I don't know, you're the oven person. I cook pizzas. I don't light them on fire. Elena frantically ran about the kitchen. Where's the fire extinguisher? Oh, I know, said Jamie running into the back room while Elena grabbed some oven mitts. Jamie stumbled into the kitchen with the fire extinguisher in hand. You know how to use that thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Elena jerked the oven door open, sending tentacles of flame in Jamie's direction. A billowing wave of heat filled Marietti's pizzeria as Jamie fumbled with the fire extinguisher, struggling to get it to work. Jamie, I thought you... Elena was interrupted by a blasting of white fluff that sailed onto the oven, smothering the fire in a blanket of snow. Flakes of white gunk covered Elena. A silence filled the restaurant as Jamie and Elena stood frozen. Jamie slowly lowered the fire extinguisher as they had at the ready and turned to Elena for instruction. But Elena was in just as much shock. The silence was broken by the man with missing teeth. So I guess that means no pizza? Yeah, unless you want a piece of charcoal, Jamie said, still staring at the now quiet oven. Um, what Jamie means is that I think our oven will be out of commission for a while, but I'll go get you a comp card and next time you come in, your pizza will be free. Well, all right then, said the man. He looked like he wanted to complain, but didn't know where to start. Elena walked over to the back room to grab a comp card, flicking off pieces of fire extinguisher liquid off her arm, carefully stepping over the cluttered mess in the back room. It looked like in Jamie's rush to grab the fire extinguisher, they had made a real mess of the place. She found the comp cards in a dusty bin that had been knocked over. Walking back out, she heard the man talking, uh, nothing like free dinner and, the sh and a show, am I right? I suppose so, Jamie said. Here's a cop card, sir. Sorry about the inconvenience tonight. Oh, it's no problem. His eyes caught something behind them. Oh, you guys need to get your oven situation figured out. Turning around, Jamie and Elena were met with the sight of rapidly growing flames and tendrils of black smoke. Hey, Jamie, we don't happen to have any more fire extinguishers, do we? Elena whispered. Uh, I'll, I'll check. Jamie booked it into the back room. The flames rose higher and Elena watched in horror as one of the large wooden paddles next to the oven caught fire. There's no more fire extinguishers, Jamie shouted, turning to look at the growing fire that was now creeping up the walls, the thick layers of grease and grime catching with ease. Behind them, the bell on the door rang as another customer walked in. We're closed, Jamie shouted, hopping over the counter and shoving the would-be customer back out the door. What are you waiting for? We need to get out of here, Jamie yelled behind them. That was a total cliffhanger. Yay. Sorry. <laughs> no. Oh, thank you so much, Emily. Um, that was funny. I was laughing. <laughs> All right. So now we'll go on to the poetry first place winner. Okay. I, hard to follow that. <laughs> Makes me not want to order a pizza ever again. Um, Okay, so uh, first place poetry is Ashley Maleka. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Ashley uh, works in a variety of styles. And, and what I was impressed by is her ability to sort of move from sort of a concrete narrative 
uh, sense in, in, in you know, some of her work to something much more fragmented, uh, the last poem, Nepenthe. Um, it's fragmented nature, the way that it sort of adds up to a whole. Um, I was just impressed with your ability to control language, to control form, and to work really seems comfortably in more than one form. Uh, because I'm drawn to all of everything from abstract to narratively driven work. So um, congratulations. Um, thank you very much. Um, my first poem, O2 County Road 47, is in honor of my parents and the, and the house they um, moved into to start a family. Sadly, we were forced to move out of it. Um, so here it goes. O2 County Road 47. After your rambler got plowed down, I drove by the land. I saw the changes. There used to be just a house with a willow tree and a horse barn. Back in, two, in the 2000s, when I dwelled on your land, I went sledding down to two hills and in the little pasture, my mother taught my sister and I how to ride three horses. Goldie, the stubborn pony, dazzled a one-eyed horse, and Elaine, my grand aunt's show horse, in the hand-me-down western saddles, bareback, just as she had grown up in a little farm town at horse shows and county fairs. A few times from the fence, I watched Titan, wanting to imagine him racing around the tracks, galloping ahead of the other horses. Too bad I didn't, but in the long run, what did it matter? My family was lucky to board him, the huge muscular thoroughbred. One of Secretariat's descendants. Oh, how I miss your hills each time I go by. I look for the trail that may be that may be hidden on the new path, rows of homes. Form a new neighborhood, I squint and see the road once more. A car that arrived with two dogs, a family of three, and another one on the way. A trailer with two horses and enough to raise a family, thrown into a place of new beginnings. Most continued, some ended. Um, my next poem, Curiosity's Cat, is um, based off of an exercise I did in my poetry class, based off of a poem by Joy Harjo, um, Curiosity's Cat. I was Curiosity's cat. I hollered when hungry. I laid gifts at its feet. I could knead, jump, and curl up in tight spaces. I could knead. Once rubbed, I purred my content. Even when I dreamed, I dreamed a false mouse. Curiosity is the shake of catnip. It's the mouse caught in a trap. It's a bird song. It's a stream of ding. It's a string dangling within reach. I watched a movement of curiosity for nine lives. Then I heard this noise drawing me near, a little girl with braided hair, a man tending to the chickens, a bed with a blanket and book, a saucer of milk, a window seat to view to the view of another world. Then it disappeared. What remained? The swaying of tall blades of grass. I had pounced on curiosity until the end. My um, last poem, is called Neopathe. Um, it's based off of a definition, but I put it into my own terms, um, basically based off of Greek mythology. Um, one, asleep in a field of poppies, drunk from a drop of potion and dead, always drifting between one state of consciousness and the next, lost and forgotten in the own unknown, sunken faces cloaked in darkness's secrecy then chills down the backs and across the arms of those who pass by. She is suffering. One sniff, spritz, sip, all it takes to forget your pain and sorrow, they say. Lethe drowned herself in the river of her tears. She gazes at the ancients. The darkness in her eyes is like violet flowers. Please, she begs, taking a small, fragile falcon, tipping her head back and swallows a single drop of the strong, sweet, and yet potent potion. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's wonderful. Oh, well, the time has come in our program to have our judges read from their work. We're really excited because they both have pretty new stuff to read to us, I, I imagine, right? They're reading from your newest books. so. And also, um, I mentioned I do have links to their books in the Facebook um, 
event and I'll also load them up again after the event. So please check out their books. Um, I've, I've admired both of your writing for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to this. So go ahead, Mike, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, thank you again, Chris. And thanks to all the other readers. Uh, it's really is an honor to read with you and, and was so lovely to read the work of the fiction writers and to listen to the beautiful work of the poets tonight. Um, so I'm going to read us from a story in my book, Some People Let You Down. Um, the story is called Prairie Fire 1899, which basically gives you all the kind of premise you need for it. Um, and I thought I'd read the story after because I knew I'd be reading after Emily. And even though the stories are otherwise complete, couldn't be more different, I thought maybe I would I'd read a fire story as well. So this is Prairie Fire 1899, and I'm not going to get through all of it, but I'll read the, just the first few pages. First, there was nothing, just the silent, empty prairie and the darkness lying heavy over it. Then there was the train, the great black engine that had steamed out of Fargo and hurled itself west across the plains making speed because its cars were empty of freight and because every hour the engineer yelled back to the stoker to keep the fire roaring. Boiling, furious, the train heaved through the night and through the liquid pre-dawn glow, and as the sun floated up over the eastern rim of the world, the train was still churning west and towing that blazing globe behind it, pulling it up out of the dark. Mid-morning, the train stopped in the coal town of Sims, North Dakota, where it took on four cars of brown lignite and then went on, aimed at Tacoma. Ten miles outside of Sims, the stoker cleared the ash pan, tossed the white-hot clinker out of the engine into the vacant prairie, where the wheat grass and blue stem were October brown and bending in the western breeze. That breeze blew back to Sims where it was Sunday, Sabbath, and so after the hopper cars had been loaded, the work week was over, and the 43 men employed by the Northern Pacific Coal Company lined up to get their pay. Colonel Bly, the mine manager, sat at the table he set up every week on the platform at the depot, smoking his cigar and scrawling his signature across the bottom of the company script. At his right elbow stood his foreman, a tall glowering Swede in name of Knutson, who looked up each miner's name in his ledger as they approached and saw there what weight of coal had been logged for the week and calculated the man's pay in his head to tell Colonel Bly, who wrote it out on the script and signed. After that weekly sacrament, the men were free until first shift started the next morning. Some attended services at one of the three churches in town, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, which were postponed every Sunday until after the train had been loaded. Others, homesteaders, went to buy provisions for the week at the general store before starting the long walk out to their sod houses and farms. The rest made their way to the saloons where they would spend a good part of their wages and where later some commotion, insults, challenges, bets, fistfights could be expected. But before all that, during those short bright hours after being paid, their time was their own and they were free to do as they pleased. And those were the sweetest hours of the week because these were men who had been underground, breathing the black dust, crawling on their knees through the cold catacombs they had blown open with dynamite, checking the flames of their lamps to make sure that they did not burn green from the poison gas that was the earth's dank breath. And now above ground, they could breathe the free air and daylight and smell the soft breeze that came from the west. By noon, that breeze already carried the smell of smoke, though faintly, feebly. Norma Goodwin caught a hint of it as she crossed Main Street to visit her friend, Joanne Crocker, who was sick with fever. She paused and lifted her nose to the west, but she couldn't locate the smell. It was stronger an hour later when the congregation of the Sims Evangelical Lutheran Church trickled into the street. They smelled it, but no warning was raised. 
It could have been anything, just a trash fire, the usual output of a dozen stoves all warming Sunday dinner. Irvin Olin, who worked for the railroad overseeing the depot, was playing cards with August Weinrich Jr. when they caught the smell in the air. They were sitting on the porch of the depot out on the edge of town, and when he smelled it, Olin stood up and breathed and looked off to the west from beneath the brim of his hat. But he didn't see anything, just sky and prairie, both yawning empty. The first to see the smoke was old William Crump, known locally as Uncle Willie. In the war, he had fought under General Sherman at Shiloh, at Vicksburg, at Chattanooga, Atlanta, Savannah, Columbia, and afterward he had come west to Dakota Territory and worked for the railroad before his homestead section came through, 100 acres of flat grassland where Crump tried to live and raise grain for five years. But out there on the lonely prairie, his mind had turned back to the war and he had begun to live simultaneously in both times. While running a team across his field, he was riding slowly through the Georgia swamp. While shooting antelope, he was aiming at a Confederate position entrenched in the rocks along a stream. At all times, he carried in his belt a pistol he had recovered from a dead Confederate officer in 1865. He had taken a ball in the right shoulder at Vicksburg, and he could still feel it in the mornings, stiff, aching, and throughout his day he brought his left hand unthinkingly to that place. When it became too much for him out there alone, he had moved back to town. On Sundays he bought a bottle of whiskey and drank it on the roof of the grain elevator, the highest point in town, where he could see for miles and project his memory out into that blank open space and overlook the past from the safe high ground. To the passerby in the street below, he seemed a lonely watchman, scanning the western plains, waiting for something to come up over the horizon. But that afternoon, when something finally did, he did not sound any alarm. He took a drink from his bottle and raised his left hand to his shoulder, to the scar that was there beneath his shirt. Nearly an hour later, Thorsten Larsen burst into the mine shaft saloon yelling, fire, fire. Larsen homesteaded a plot three miles outside of town and was generally considered odd. At harvest time each year, he refused to help with the threshing on the grounds that the work would stiffen his fingers, which he wanted to keep limber for his hard anger fiddle. He had bought the, brought the violin with him from Norway in 1891 and often talked about it and displayed it to visitors, but no one had ever seen him play it. It was now packed along with the other things Larson had managed to salvage in his cart just outside the saloon where his wife, Laura, sat holding a rescued shoat in her arms. Small mind was paid to Larsen at first. He was yelling fire, fire, and speaking rapid Norwegian, but consumed as they were in other pursuits. The miners did not register what he said for some minutes until, like a wave, the news spread through the bar room. And then, in a great rush, the men hurried through the door to see for themselves. There it was now, the low gray smear along the western horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. That's free. It's, it's always interesting to me to imagine that life of our ancestors, you know, and how different it was, but how similar as well. It was just very evocative. Thank you. And we will end our reading tonight with a reading from William Reichard's new book. I mean, how long has it been out, Bill? Uh, it came out April 1st. Okay, so very new. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. And um, it was a pleasure to read everybody's work. Uh, it was difficult to make choices because the work is so wonderful. Uh, I found that really, really delightful. So. Um, I'll read a few pieces from my new book. It's called Our Delicate Barricades Down. This is called On Her Way to the Next World, My Mother Passes By. I woke in the middle of the night, didn't check the time. Waking up in the dark isn't new to me. I rarely sleep uninterrupted. 
As I sat up in bed, I saw a shadow pass from the left of the room to the right. It had no particular features, but I knew it was her. Maybe it was the shadow's gait, the way she used to walk before the cane and the swollen legs. Maybe the shape or the height. It didn't turn to look at me or speak. It was moving steadily with purpose. It had a place to be. I think she wanted me to know she was on her way, but didn't have time for agonized looks or final goodbyes. We'd rehearsed these things over and over the last few years. She was ready. She'd already started the journey. Um, these are prose poems. Uh, I guess I should preface that. Um, kind of connected by the land, really. It was, it was wonderful to hear Mike's piece and, and hear him talk about that, the prairie. And um, a lot of these poems are set there. So this is called A Question of the Body. The soil there was primarily clay, sticky, slick, harvesting carrots, radishes, beets, washing the clinging dirt away with icy well water, and the water full of iron, so strong a single glass left the taste of metal in my mouth. Yet it didn't steal me against that hard life. The air there was filled with conflicting scents, fresh mown alfalfa against the stench of the stockyard next door, peony and piss, lilac and tractor exhaust. My blood was iron. My blood was smoke from the endless stream of cigarettes my family consumed, cut me and a wisp of burnt tobacco drifted from the wound. My trees, my bones were trees, oak, silver maple, ash, box elder, my hair, the weightless fluff from the cottonwood seeds, my body, the flat land, the subtle hills that rolled from acre to acre, frigid river water, the unseen undercurrent, the brackish pools near the shore, my nerves spreading out in endless tributaries. What held me together? Gravel roads and hot tar, snow drifts and icicles, sheer will, dreams, confusion. Uh, this piece is called Poor. The shuttered bar's wall collapses, falls into the laundromat. Dirty clothes for days and nowhere to wash the oversized blankets, the heavy quilts stitched from remnants of grandmother's dresses. Winter is coming, so they get out the lath and heavy plastic. I knew families who lived like that, broken windows patched with canvas tarps, frozen breath forming clouds in the unheated kitchen. I knew families who depended on the meat their men would hunt each autumn. No game meant nothing to eat, shamefaced trips to the food shelves. A semblance of strength trumped the cries of a hungry child, and I would see those kids in the school hallways, pale and thin, lacking breakfast and focus. I was one of those kids, could always spot my kind, missing dead fathers, mothers eaten up by poor pay at local factories. Someone might ask, how poor are you? But you could not say, not to teachers, not to friends. Silence equaled strength, the ability to deny yourself everything. Those houses are empty now, bankrupt or abandoned, farmsteads unable to support any family. I see them on my way to visit my elderly mother. The animals take over and trees grow up through kitchen floors. The upper bedrooms become aviaries full of birds and owls that eat the birds, with bats sequestered in every corner. Uh, this one's called Long Dra Gravel Drive that was sort of based on a, what I think is a folk kind of folk tale or, you know, vicious rumor. It might be based on a true story. Long Gravel Drive. There was nothing special about that place. Local teenagers on drunken weekend nights used to dare each other to travel down the lonely gravel drive, pull up to the long abandoned house and go inside. Something inhabited that house. Call it a ghost or call it a memory, an event so vivid it was etched into the lath and plaster walls. In the presence of a living soul, the thing played itself out like a record with a scratch. So every time the music started, it would play up to one exact moment, then jump back to the beginning again. Over and over, a dark form, an arm raised to scream, a hammer blow, 
the whole family dead in the murder and never found. If you went in, you didn't stay long. And after you ran out nearly paralyzed by fear, you lied to your friends, told them it was nothing, called them chicken shits when they wouldn't take their turn inside. Um, there are a lot of ghosts in this book. Um, most of them are metaphorical. Some of them are real. Uh, this is called At Last. Did you look for me in all the usual places? Out walking along the deserted gravel road, out among the trees in the moonlight, my shadow melted to their tall, thick trunks. Did you think it was me when you saw the glowing eyes of the nocturnal animal staring out at you from the tall grass? Did you look for me in those places where you wanted most to find me, the bedroom, the kitchen, the wide front porch sitting on an old swing's crumbling seat? Or did you look for me in those places I love most, the library late at night, drifting like dust among the well-packed stacks, the old movie house that plays a different pair of classic films every night, or the used bookshop or the great glass conservatory hiding among the orchids and the palms, my face a mask of flowers. Did you find me or someone who looks like me? My face is unremarkable, my hair a common brown, my eyes green like the algae that blooms at the edges of a still pond. Did you find me or someone you wanted to be me? Hope shapes our vision and desire warps it. If you can't see me, perhaps I'm only a spirit. What remains of a dream once the dreamer wakes? Or a ghost. Can you say what a ghost is? Can you tell me I am not one? And um, I think I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you so much, Bill. I, yeah, it was just amazing. That last one I think was like, very much how a lot of us feel kind of coming out of that pandemic, you know, like, am I real? Am I, <laughs> am I really here? It's the um, last poem in the book as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I also was remiss in the beginning for not thanking my amazing colleagues who, without whom this would never happen. Um, thank you to Lynette Rainey Grandel, to Tom Maltman, to Alicia Conroy, Heidi Sherwick, um, Deanna Larson, uh, Layla Dalashahi, uh, Matt Mauk. Um, who am I forgetting? Anybody? I, I think that we had a lot of help this year. It was really fantastic. So um, historically, it's been a whole committee that that it takes to put this on, and and um, and we pulled a committee together of our my wonderful colleagues and. I'm just so happy that uh, we have such a wonderful department and so many published writers on our, our faculty who really help make these things happen for students. So thank you so much to the other faculty members. Thank you students uh, for this amazing uh, set of writing. Um, you know, every year I'm blown away. This year I laughed, I cried, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was just fantastic and a big huge thank you again to the judges um, for all um, the uh, the things that you the time you took to do this it was kind of a quick turnaround and we really appreciated that um, so thank you all for your work um, and please everyone keep writing uh, we you know keep keep doing the work and and putting it out there you know um so this concludes our uh live stream of the patsy lee core award um just want to give another round of applause to everybody it's kind of strange online doing that but hey <laughs> we're doing it <laughs> so thank you very much